There's going. Okay. Good evening, Saints. Welcome to Grace Baptist Church. We're in the third chapter of Romans. We will take up with verse 9 as we approach our um, ending of this study, of this part, and then we will go back to chapter 12. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no way. For we have before proved both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not even one. Their throat is an open sepulchre, and their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Our Abba Father, we thank you for your word as we read these words tonight. We understand this applies to each and every son of Adam, daughter of Adam, that has ever lived or will ever live. We look and we see who we are. We compare ourselves to this and we see how far short. Father, in all of this, though, show us Christ. May we hear the soft sound of his sandals feet tonight. May we see Jesus in him only. We pray these things in His name through the power of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. This is a, a very sobering passage. And almost every one of these verses are quotations out of the Old Testament. Sometimes we look at the New Testament and we forget just how much of it was quoted from the Old Testament. We're going to look at some of these verses tonight, but I would first point you to Matthew 27, verse 46. Matthew 27, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is a quotation from the 22nd Psalm. And Christ is hanging between heaven and earth, representing his people. And he is representing people that are sinners. We all come into the world as we looked in Romans 5 as sinners. We are declared sinners because of what our representative did. It would be like if you elect somebody into office and he goes and he enacts a law. You didn't personally vote for that law, but you voted for the person that passed the law. Adam was appointed as a representative. He was the best man available. He was a perfect man. And he had one rule, and that was don't eat of the tree in the middle of the garden. And instead of trusting God, he trusted himself, wanting something that was not his, and that is to be God. And by doing that, he condemned himself and everybody 
that came that he represented and so we are born a sinner he became a sinner we don't become sinners we are born sinners now why was Christ saying why have you forsaken me it's because the people he represented needed a savior and he quoted this verse and so this is the backdrop to what Christ was doing that day and the backdrop to what Paul is talking about in the third chapter comes from the Old Testament we see in uh, Psalm 14 1 through 3 the fool has said in his heart there is no God they are corrupt they have done abominable works there is none that doeth good see where that comes from Paul quoted that in the third chapter the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God and what does Paul say no one seeks God no one understands and he says they are all gone aside they are all together become filthy there is none that doeth good no not one have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge and we see in Psalm 53 virtually the same thing so I'm not going to read it then I would point you to Ecclesiastes most of the time when we think of this we think a time to be born a time to die but in Ecclesiastes 7 Solomon writes there is not a just man upon earth that does good and sinneth not not even one son of Adam when he wrote this Christ did not come there is one then we see in Psalm 5 9 there is no faithfulness in their mouth their inward part is very wickedness their throat is an open sepulcher they flatter with their tongue you know what a sepulcher is right a grave our mouth in our natural state is a tomb with rottenness in it out of the heart we speak and those not in Christ have an evil heart all we think about is ourselves and our throat is an open sepulcher a place of death we flatter one another with our tongue then we see in Psalm 10 7 his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. Quite an indictment on us, isn't it? We see in Psalm 36, 1. The transgression of the wicked saith with my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. The person that is not in Christ has no awe for God, no fear of God. All we, all we think about is getting away with what we do. Psalm 140, verse 3. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. Selah. Yet any worse than what they're describing? Well, listen to what Isaiah says. Their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not. And there is no justice in their goings. They have made their <coughs> crooked paths. Whosoever goeth in them shall not know peace. When we think about what sin is, is more than just 
one little definition. And Paul has covered quite a few bases there. I would have you uh, reflect though that in Romans the 10th chapter, 10th verse and we will come back to this for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. But something has to happen to a person before he can do that because in his natural state we are all the things that Paul has just talked about. If you look back in verse 3 I mean, chapter 3, 20 and 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I want to cover some of this tonight because next week we will be looking at this passage. I want to spend more time on the rest of it rather than this verse. But when we look at this, it says all have sinned. What does he mean all have sinned? Well, there are several definitions of sin. One is, it's a transgression, an overstepping of the law. There's a line there, and we're not to go beyond it. In other words, we're not to take things that don't belong to us. We're not to claim things that don't belong to us. The divine boundary between good and evil. Two, it can be iniquity, an act inherently wrong, whether expressly forbidden or not. Three, it can be an error, a departure from right. Four, missing the mark, a failure to meet the divine standard. And in this verse, this is a word he uses, miss the mark. We have all missed the mark. What's the mark? The glory of God. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. And we continue to fall short, even in our renewed state, our regenerated state, we are not perfect. Every day we need a Savior. Five, it can be a trespass. The intrusion of self-willed into the sphere of divine authority. Wasn't that what Adam did? God was God, and Adam wanted to be God. That was a temptation that was used. Six, lawlessness or spiritual anarchy. Seven, unbelief or an insult to the divine truth. Sin, originated with Satan but he entered the world through Adam was and is universal Christ alone accepted because it says all have sinned all have come short of the glory of God no one does good no one is righteous so sin can be summarized as a three part thing an act the violation or want of obedience to the revealed will of God. Two, a state or absence of righteousness. And three, a nature, enmity toward God. And all in Adam do all three things. So maybe <clears throat> when Christ was up there on the cross and he asked, Why have you forsaken me? We know why. We have just read why. We're not good. We cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. So maybe a better question is, why will you accept us, God? Well, because there was one that was righteous. There was one that understood. There was one that sought God. There was one that didn't go out of the way. There was one that was profitable. There was one that does good all the time. His throat was not of death, but life-giving words. He did not have poison on his tongue but forgiveness and healing. He never cursed. He was not bitter. His feet shed his own blood, not others. And destruction and misery was not his way. 
and he is the Prince of Peace. And he was always in fear of God as a man. He said, I always do the things that please my Father. It was an awesome fear. It was not a fear of terror of God, but it was a fear of awe of who His Father was. So, therefore, by the deeds of the law, our works, our deeds, cannot justify us but there was one by whose deeds we can be justified and that is the Lord Jesus Christ the law shows us our need of a savior it shows us the knowledge of sin the law cannot save us even if today forward we obeyed every precept of the law with a proper motive and with a heart of love, it would not save us because we continually fall short of the glory of God. If we look briefly at chapter 5, Romans, therefore being declared righteous. When Martin Luther was struggling in the early 1500s, he saw and now you have to remember that the the Bible at that time was mostly written in Latin where he was and it talks about being justified and the Latin definition for justified is made righteous and Luther looked at the law and he looked at what he did and he knew there was no way that he could be justified the harder he tried the more he fell behind. And then one day, he was reading in a Greek Bible. And the word justify means declared righteous. He could be declared righteous even though he was not righteous. And being declared righteous, he would be treated as if he was righteous. Because Christ had paid for all his sins and he had a life of righteousness that he could give to the believer. So we see in this Romans 5, and we've already covered this. You can go back and look at the, the sermons. Being declared righteous gives us a new relationship to God. We're no longer standing before him as he being our judge. We are standing before Him as He is our Father. Yes. We have been adopted into the family. We have a new relationship. We are no longer in Adam. We are in Christ, our elder brother. Not only that, verses 12 through 19 says we have a new representative. We're no longer in Adam. We're in Christ. And He stands before the Father every day making intercession for his people. And if that wasn't good enough, in verses 20 and 21, chapter 5, we're in a new realm, or a new reign, or a new residence, as it were. We're the palace brats. I would urge you to look to Christ. Come to him. Confess him as Lord. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. I read that earlier from Romans 10. 10 9. That if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then 10 was what I read. Or, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with mouth confession is made unto salvation. Whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. There is no difference between Jews and Greeks for the same Lord over all is rich unto all those that call upon him. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
Amen. One of my favorite musicians, and this is, you know, you go. It's like you go through seasons. We have a lot of good music coming out today, especially by the Gettys and City of Light and Sovereign Grace. They're all good. I love them. But during this time when this hymn was written, you had um, Isaac Watts. You had Charles Wesley. Now, I may leave one out here. And Augustus Toplady. And I wanted to read one. I'm not going to sing it. Teresa told me that uh, if I sung it, um, she would disown me, so I'm going to uh -huh. read it. <laughs> A debtor to mercy alone, of covenant mercy I sing, nor fear with the righteousness on my person and offering bring. The terrors of law of God with me can have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from view. Did you know that you can stand before God and He can't see a single sin because you're covered in Christ? Oh, what a glory to be able to stand before God in another person's clothes. The work which His goodness began the arm of His strength will complete. His promise is yea and amen and never was forfeited even yet. Things future, not things that are now, not all things below or above can make His purpose forego or sever my soul from His love. God looks on Christ every day and you cannot be cut off from His love. My name from the palms of his hands, Isaiah 49. Eternity will not erase. Your name cannot be erased from the palms of the hands of Christ if you come to him. Remains impressed on his heart. It removes. In marks of indelible grace, yes, I to the end shall endure. As such as the earnest is given, we have the down payment now of the Holy Spirit. More happy, but not more secure, the glorified spirits in heaven. By Augustus Top Lady. Go in peace and grace, and may the Lord bless you greatly. May he, His face shine upon you. If you have not come to Him, I urge you once again to run to Christ today. As today is what you can have. You're not promised tomorrow. Look, as Isaiah said, look to Christ, for He is God. And there is no one else like Him, because at His name, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. Isaiah 45, 22, and 23. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you. I like that.